welcome the speaker speaker, Patricia Frick. Thank you. As a brilliant consultant, what would you have said in this circumstance? I was sitting across the desk from one of the most brilliant men I have ever had the privilege of working with. He was the president of a $2 billion software company, and I was about to have to tell him, sir, at this point, your speech is getting boring. Now step back and to put this conversation into context. Pat Wynn, who was in charge of the National Sales Conference, said, Patricia, as you know, we are a large software company and we have just acquired one of our major competitors. The January sales meeting at Bellagio is very important. We have 1,500 salespeople. 40% of them were acquired. And we need everyone to know they are working for the right company at the right time. Their future is bright and our new strategy is strong. Your work with all our executives and engineers has been very well received. Our president lives in Paris and next week he'll be here and we'd like you to work with him on his presentation. He's not a bad speaker. <laughs> He's very intelligent, a little shy, an engineer, but our company doesn't have any rock stars. Can you turn him into a corporate rock star? And you have four hours. He walked in, and as I do with all my clients that I have very little time to work with, I said, how do you do? If you had one sentence rather than 45 minutes, what would you say? He said, this is a brand new company. I said, great, write that down. Your opening line is welcome to a brand new company. Now, who decided it was going to be a new company? It wasn't these salespeople. He said, it was the board of directors. I said, well, paint the scene. Who said what to whom? He said, Arnold, who'd been on the board for 10 years, said, Bernard, what can we do once and forever to grab the market share? And I told them we could do this or that or take the boldest move ever and buy our competitors, which, as you know, they did. And as we were talking through his strategy, I asked Bernard, when was the first time you realized the importance of strategy? He said, I was a 14-year-old ball boy before the French Open. And what people didn't realize, they came in to see the French Open, and there was a tournament of the ball boys. And he said, my competitor was my best friend, and we were equally matched. But on that occasion, the ball boys were girls. And at 14, girls are enough of a distraction. And he said, our ball boy girl was my best friend's sister, and the way she was throwing the balls was sabotaging my game. So he said, Patricia, that was when I learned the importance of strategy. And as every executive asks, do they really want to hear these stories? And I said, yes, because your Salespeople will respect a position. They will work extra hard and be dedicated to the person behind the position. And as we conversationally created his presentation in the order that he would be delivering it, we then got to the point of corporate citizenship. There'd been a tsunami, and the salespeople had donated $360,000, and the company had matched it. And this was obviously a subject he cared a lot about. And his speech was getting boring. 
Now let's go back to your question. You've got the situation, you're doing amazingly well, and now, just at the point when we are getting to a speech that has to come to a crescendo, because soon we would be having a call for action and a close, the speech is boring. What, as a brilliant consultant, in that circumstance, would you have said to that client? And the person with the best answer is going to win how to open your presentations with impact, eight ways to grab your audience. Raise your hand if you would like to volunteer what you would have said to that client in that circumstance. All right, good. A woman, the first person, honestly, should shame the gentleman. Come closer. Come, good. What would you have said? I would make it about the audience, and I would start saying, so what does this mean to you? And I would thank them for their commitment to the community, but I would say, tell me how, I would, I would turn around and get the, the audience involved. All right, well, as you're the first brave person, you are winning a prize, thank you. Would anyone else like to make a contribution? Yes, sir, what would you have said in that circumstance? I would just tell him, be natural, tell the truth, be honest, and enjoy what you're going to be saying. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Any other suggestions? Remember, the speech is getting boring. We've had great rapport. All right. I have one of your star employees, somebody that's done something really out of the ordinary, um, do the presentation or part of it. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, I'm coming into the dark just to hear what you're saying. I think you could say to him, I think you could do better at this point, and I'd like you to consider a couple of ideas. Okay, good. Thank you for your contribution. Yes, sir? I'd tell him to focus on the tsunami and the people that really made the difference in that company, because they're the ones that are engaged, and they're going to drive that company forward. All right, good. Mm -hmm. All right, last comment. Oh. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, I didn't see you. My dear is my number one fan in this room. As the first person in the room, you get to say something. What do you think you need to stop doing to be more effective? All right. Good. All good answers. After all, you're very smart consultants. Now, you haven't heard me tell this story before, have you? No, okay, no. good. I didn't know if I no, had it no. down. Okay. <laughs> all right. I was a ball boy with a strategy. And we are all ball boys. All right, good. So you would tie it in an earlier comment, good strategy. What I actually said was, Bernard, how would you describe corporate citizenship to your children? And he said, it was the day after Christmas, and I sat my two children down and said, you are very lucky children because you have generous parents and you have even more generous grandparents. And perhaps you would like to give us back one of your gift certificates or Christmas presents, and we will take the money and donate to the children who no longer have homes. And he said, I was so proud of my little boy. He's 14, and the next day he said, Papa, how much should I give? Because I could give you all of my savings and all of my pocket money and all of my Christmas presents and it still wouldn't be enough to make a difference. And I told him, oh, you never give it all. You just give enough that it hurts a little. Now, as consultants, you all know the power of a simple, well-placed question. And then you have to pause and listen for your clients to realize how brilliant they might be. Welcome to Good to Great to Awesome, How to Wow Any Audience and Let's Add at Any Time or Any Circumstance. 
Now, will you raise your hand if you were one of the people, and I have talked to a few of you during the conference, says, well, I never give presentations, and I'm not interested in giving presentations. Just raise your hand. If you think you don't give presentations, you're never going to give presentations. Well, there have been a few people who have said it to me, even if you're not brave enough, or perhaps they didn't stay. Outside the privacy of your own home, all speaking is public speaking. There is no such thing as private speaking. You talk to a client of an audience of one or two, a prospect, a client. You run a focus group. You do a client debrief. It is all public speaking. And whether your audience is one or two, five, ten, fifty, or five thousand, many of the principles of how you communicate more effectively are exactly the same. You need a simple structure, impactful opening, emotional connection, memorable stories, and razor-sharp specificity. Next question for you. Will you raise your hand if during this conference you have sat, listened to a presenter who at some point made you some offer, make an appointment for a go-to meeting, or analyze what you're doing, give me your card, we'll set up a conversation. And you so enjoyed their presentation, you so valued your expertise that you were at least willing to invest some time to have a conversation that perhaps will lead to you doing business with that person. Will you raise your hand if that has happened? Ladies and gentlemen, keep your hands up. That is the power of delivering a presentation. And if you think, well, outside of my clients, I am not going to speak. Just look at your own informal research, the power of a presentation to an interested audience. Two months ago, I received an email. I am a great fan of yours, could I interview for my blog? Now I know we all have many emails like this. So I thought, well, before I email and say contact me again in January, I will click on the link. And when I looked at this movie star handsome person, I picked up the phone and said, what is an Emmy award winning TV host and game show host doing being one of my fans? Well, we had a great conversation. Obviously, he had the interview. And then after a 30 minute conversation, he said, Patricia, what is the one secret of delivering a great presentation. And I said, well, there is no one secret. Please frame. I am sure as a consultant, and for those of you who are good speakers already, you have developed the habit, perhaps not consciously, but become aware, whether it's speaking, consulting, or having conversations with interesting people. Develop the habit of sitting on your own shoulder, as it were, and listening into your own conversations. Because when you are having an interesting conversation with brilliant people, it inspires you to say something profound or interesting that you know you have not said before. Record it. Because this flash of genius or brilliance might not come again. Record it. And as I was saying, there is no one secret. I said, a brand new fripicism is about to fall from my lips. <laughs> Let me write it down before I tell you, because I might want to use this again. I said, there is no one secret. However, if there were a secret, it would be that your subject would be of interest to your audience. 
as you are brilliant consultants, and this, you have just proved this works at your own conference. You are brilliant consultants. So although we will discuss how you, you can deliver even more brilliant presentations, if you are in front of an audience who is genuinely interested in your subject, then they will forgive you while you're developing your fancy footwork. As an executive speech coach, it is a lot tougher to take someone with a great personality and great on stage who really doesn't have a lot of content to develop their second presentation that is to take someone who is brilliant, has great expertise, and help craft a really impactful business creating presentation. So let's look at structure. Have you ever been at one of your clients' meetings, and I would think the answer is yes, perhaps they're having a conference, and suddenly they look at you in the audience, and they, they'll say, Summers, Aldona, Rick, wow, wasn't, didn't know you were going to be here. We're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Why don't you come up and give us a report on? And you have 12 rows to walk on stage to deliver 10 minutes. This is a good client you want to do well. When you understand a simple speech structure, you can handle that superbly well when you have the formula. Every presentation has a central theme. Every conversation with a client has a central theme, a premise, a basis of argument leading to a conclusion. Our premise is every consultant can go from good to great to awesome and woo any audience. Now, if we were sitting having a conversation and you said, Patricia, what are you going to talk about? I say, well, how do you woo any audience? You say, oh, that sounds good. How do you do it? So you see, whether it's a conversation or in a presentation, you deliver what you are going to talk about, every consultant can. Or the ABC company would be better off if they did. Central theme. The audience of one would ask you, how do we do that? An audience would think, that sounds good, how do I do that? And then, the talking points, what I would call the points of wisdom, are how you do it. In our case, simple structure. Compelling openings. Emotional connection. Memorable stories and razor sharp specificity. Then, as a brilliant consultant, I would recommend you have in your back pocket openings that can work for you. Jerry Lewis said, my best ad libs take eight hours to write. What makes it an ad lib is you never quite know when you're going to use it. But as a consultant or a speaker, although every assignment might be slightly different, we have our formulas, we have our structures, we have our methodologies, so there are portions of our conversation. Even I was talking to Rick last night. He is famous because 70% of his speech for this audience is going to be different than every other one. Well, I say yes, but look, the 25% can be worked to a nuance and have in your back pocket, even if there are different formulas, because some parts of our conversations are always going to be the same. Have your focus ways of opening. You could open with a question. As a brilliant consultant, what would you have done in this circumstance? You could start with a rhetorical question. If I were to ask you, is 2014 going to the be, be the year you double your sales? Perhaps you'd say yes. <coughs> Perhaps you'd say no. Most likely you would say, Patricia, I would love it to be. Can you tell me how? Well, congratulations, you're at the right place at the right time, and in the next 60 minutes, we will look at 14 specific ways you can double your business with your same database. 
So you see, you all you whatever approach you have at the beginning, it naturally transitions into your central theme. Whether you have five minutes, ten minutes, or an hour. So structure, opening. Imagine going in, this is a presentation to get you a new client. Or perhaps it is to renew a contract. Perhaps you are speaking at an industry event that you specialize in. How about starting with an interesting statistic or little known fact from their world, not yours, that they don't know? Well, my favorite example is I was booked to speak to 350 Seventh-day Adventist pastors. The subject was how to design and deliver a more charismatic sermon. Now, I am smart enough to know, and I've been around long enough to know, people are going to be looking at the program thinking, hmm, she's the only person on the program who isn't a minister. How can anyone who isn't a minister tell me how to write a better sermon? I write one every week. I bet she isn't even a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Obviously, they are smart enough and generous enough to know somebody on the program committee thought you deserved a slot on the program. So I walked on stage and said, 465 times in the Bible, it said it came to pass. It did not say it came to stay. <laughs> and unless your sermon is well constructed, artfully crafted, and charismatic delivered, it will not come to stay in the hearts, minds, and lives of your congregation. <laughs> When you hear 350 amens, you know they are not leaving early. But an interesting statistic, the opening of a presentation or a sales presentation or a conversation, I compare it to the opening of a movie which is called the flavor scene. The third way you can woo an audience, be it one, 100, or 1,000, and that is emotional connection. Now you understand this is from good to great to awesome. And how we open our presentations, how we talk, could be a theatrical choice. But I would suggest that when the audience understands we have their best interest at heart, especially in a situation when they're comparing you against another consulting company, most presenters will say, I am going to talk about what I would like to do first. What I'd love to talk about. Nobody cares about us. They care about themselves. Now, obviously, that is, I speak in black and white to get your attention. Obviously, we have a relationship. People care about us. I would recommend that you turn this around. After your opening, you say, in the next 45 minutes, you will learn four specific ways that you can transform your organization. If you are serious about presenting, record, and it could be a dry run, record one of your presentations or sales conversations or any presentation to a client and have it transcribed. Because what we say and what we think we say is very different. Now it's going to be very useful because you can turn it into blog posts and articles so you can repurpose it. First of all, get your script and circle all the eyes and look at the ways that you could change that to you. It'll make a difference. Then there's another way, view it from the point of view of somebody else. 
For example, every year I have a, a conference I'm part of called Lady, of the Ch Lady and the Champs with some of my partners who are international world champions of public speaking. And in one of the sessions, I, I was inviting people to come up and deliver their opening line, was, was delivering mini coaching, just helping them improve. One gentleman, Stephen, was deaf. And obviously, we were very sympathetic. But he was talking about this experience, and I took him aside and whispered. Now, I had to be a rather loud whisper, whisper as he was deaf. And I said, try it this way. Imagine how my parents felt. As the doctor walked into the waiting room and said, I hate to tell you, but your beautiful baby boy is deaf. You could tell by the audience the change. Because nearly all of the audience were parents and they could emotionally connect to the situation. Great content and ways to open a presentation come in the middle of a conversation. I spend a lot of time with my speaker buddies and often in the middle of a conversation I'll say, do you ever say that in your presentations? And often I hear, no, I said, you should, it's better than your content. <laughs> because what you say to entertain your friends is exactly what an audience will love. Sitting in the presentation, I love Charlotte's presentation this morning, never heard it before. I was in awe that anyone could be that smart. And uh, two thirds into a presentation, I wrote down an opening line, and it came in the middle of her presentation. But imagine her walking out and saying, can you imagine the impact of being raised by a mother who frequently said, Charlotte, it is immoral to not use all your talents. At age six, she had no idea she was defining my career choice as a consultant. Every new manager, and I'm sure you have this with your clients, every new manager has to introduce themselves to their team and they have to give them their storyline. And most people say, and I know you hear it as well, I don't like talking about myself. Well, of course not, because they feel they are being immodest. So I always say, well, let's look at it from your mentors and role models who crafted you, gave you advice that you are now the success. So what you're really talking about is your lifeline from the point of view of your mother, your high school counselor, your first boss and mentor, a business consultant you work with, whoever it is. And this way, you're giving away, as it were, the power of what made you successful. And it's almost like a made-for-television movie. Good opening, so you can grab the audience and it's the flavor of what comes in. Look at emotional connection, which comes from, one, eye contact, two, what I would call the more you focused on the conversation and through stories. As a consultant, I am sure you, you talk about and you give examples of great case histories, the, the clients that you've helped, which will be a model for the client, the prospect you're now talking to. They will understand your process. And one great story model to follow is situation, solution, success. What was the situation when your client first called you? What was the solution of what you did? And what was the success, the happy ever after? And then what we want to do is we want to populate our stories with flesh and blood characters that our audience of our prospects can relate to. And it's very important in the situation of the success that the words are of the words of your clients. For 
example. This is a very simple example. One of my friends was a sales manager of the Fairmont Hotel. And one day he called and said, Hey, Patricia, as you know, I'm a great salesman one-on-one. -on -one. However, I have the opportunity to speak to an eight-person committee. They're staying at the Fairmont for a fan trip. And, and if they bring their convention to San Francisco, they're, they're going to come to the Fairmont, but they're seriously considering San Diego. But I'm really nervous that I have to stand up and speak. So I said, well, let's step backwards. What are you selling? Well, he said, I'm not really selling the Fairmont. That's a given. It's selling San Francisco. I said, good, and you never knock your competition. How long do you have to speak? Seven minutes. What is it worth to the Fairmont if you get the business? He said $500,000. So let me get this right. You have seven minutes to make $500,000. That is $1,048.67 a second. <laughs> Even when you pause. So left to your own resources, how would you start this presentation? He said, well, I'm really glad that you're staying at the Fairmont and you're having a great time and really well, you'll select us and we'll go beyond the call of duty. I said, you're being very polite, but you've wasted $20,000 and you haven't said <laughs> Why don't you try this approach? Because understand the situation. He's been showing around, they know him, he's on the agenda, they introduce, he walks up and says, in the next seven minutes, you will decide the best decision you can make for your association and your members is to bring your convention to San Francisco and the Fairmont. Five you are yours, one Fairmont. That is an emotional connection. Then, San Diego is a magnificent destination. And you should go there another year. However, the reasons you should come to San Francisco this year are specific, 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 specific. This is intellectual, analytical reasons that they can go by and justify why they made the choice. Then at the end, and imagine years from now when your convention attendees are sitting around a convention lobby reminiscing about the best conventions they ever attended. And they remember the one in San Francisco at the Fairmont when you were the planning committee. <laughs> <laughs> you know from volunteering in your own organizations there's a lot more work than this glory. Now, did he say, come here and I will make sure you go down in your association history? He didn't say that, but do you think they might have thought it? <laughs> See, emotional opening and close, analytical reasons in between. My mission is to clean up sloppy language. Now, just look at the difference. There are three things that will make you successful. There are three strategies that will make you more successful. There are three methodologies that will make you more successful. There are three techniques. In other words, what we want our presentations to be is conversational sounding. But the difference between a conversation and a conversational sounding presentation is that we actually think about it in advance. If there were one mistake that most good business professionals or speakers or consultants make, it's to think, because I'm experienced, I can wing it. My brother, he's the genius in the family, an internationally acclaimed rock and roll guitarist, but he always says, every time you put your foot on the stage, it is the assumption of innocence within a context of experience. In other words, he might have been playing a guitar 
full 50 years. But the first, this time he puts his foot on the stage, it is the first time for this audience in this venue at this period of time. You could have been consulting for 30 years, but every assignment, see you have the context of your experience, but this one is new and fresh. Every time we step on stage, the last 300 audiences might have loved you, but you don't know if this one will. You can't take it for granted. And working on the principle that quality will spread, more specificity will spread throughout your conversations and presentations. In conversation, you start, you don't, it's not planned, you don't use specific language, you say things, you have run-on sentences, you don't pause, you start sentences, you don't finish them, that's conversation. That isn't a more formal presentation. The next one, and I have heard it from some of the best speakers at this conference. Stuff. Uh, uh. Stuff is debris, it's rubbish. If we talk about our expertise as stuff, we devalue. Who wants to pay your high fees for rubbish? One of my clients, they had just invested $40 million on a new program. He was one of the most eloquent executives I've ever heard. He was on stage, international manager, was fabulous, and then suddenly he said, our clients need our stuff. Now I ask you, it costs $40 million and you call it debris. Look at, how can you manage a sales force that said, oh boss, I went to a trade show and I came home with a ton of leads. You, you couldn't even walk out of the trade show with a ton of business cards. Be specific. Bunches are for grapes. You don't go and have a bunch of ideas. I heard 16 superb presentations, took 40 pages of notes, made up an action list, and there are 16 actions I'm taking in the next week. That's specific. I was the closing speaker for a, tr a company called Bartlett Tree Companies. So my opening in that case was, I called the Bartler office in San Francisco and said, I'd like someone to come look at my trees. But I warn you, I'm not going to be a very big customer. I only have two trees. To which Marilyn, who worked in the San Francisco office for a month, said, oh, madam, we don't have any little customers. Everyone's equally important to us. I wish you could have been there the day my very own Bartlett tree expert came to call. He called and said, Miss Fritt, I will be two minutes late. And when he arrived, I said, are you living in your car? He said, no, I'm on my way to my honeymoon, but I wanted to come and look at your trees first. <laughs> uh, I made two of their everyday heroes, the stars of my presentation, which of course led to spin-off business. Now once you become a customer, what do you do next time? Well, I don't know what Rick did, but I went out, of course, with a digital camera. I took a day of my life, and I met the salespeople in the morning for breakfast, and then I went out. I wore a Bartlett t-shirt and hard hat, and boots and jeans, and of course, it was being recorded. I was just picking up the leaves, dragging them out. I couldn't sit in one of their vehicles and have it move, but I could sit when it was still for the photo opportunity. And so next time I was introduced, it was as one of their own employees. That was the showing the pictures. That is emotional connection for your clients. This summer was my 37th consecutive National Speakers Association convention. At my second convention in 1978, Kenneth McFarland, who was considered the dean of American speakers, we all wanted to grow up and be as profound as Dr. McFarland. He said, it is good for speakers, and great advice for consultants. He said, speak on a subject that is of interest to you and your audience. Say it well, 
and stop. And when you have finished, your audience should know what you know and how you know it. Thank you for the invitation. I hope you will always remember Fripp. However, much more important than remembering me, remember what Fripp stands for. Frequently reinforce ideas that are productive and profitable. Thank you. Was Patricia worth staying for? Yeah. Absolutely. Clients hire me to help them have the competitive advantage that comes from being more powerfully persuasive than the competition. Are you speaking to be remembered and repeated? When you engage me to speak at your meeting or event, my content can be delivered as a keynote or a breakout session. Many of my clients hire me for both. Let's have a conversation.